This is the fastest consumer graphics card from AMD. But more specifically, this is one of the cheapest custom variants of that card, the ASRock 7900 XTX Phantom Gaming. We're talking RTX 4080 level of performance, 3090 Ti in ray tracing, all while providing the best value of the current generation so far. But that pricing is with the reference design, which admittedly looks pretty awesome. But even if AMD have fixed their vapor chamber issues, high temps, loud fans, these are all common complaints of AMD's reference card. So a custom model like this Phantom Gaming is likely the better option then. And I dare say maybe even better looking. But the problem with a custom model like this is they can easily increase the cost by $100 or more. And with that cost increase, you do often see an uplift in performance, but rarely ever is an uplift in performance proportional to the increase in cost. And 10% over MSRP changes our value numbers entirely. Wait, what? The Phantom is cheaper than the reference version, while running cooler, quieter, faster, and brighter. Then why on earth are people still buying the reference version when this exists? Well, I'll tell you, because we're going to directly compare these two graphics cards against one another, and by the end, I'm going to show you two reasons why I'm choosing the reference version over this card, but for literally everything else. If the Phantom is the same price, give or take about 5%, the Phantom would be my go-to recommendation. If Azeroth fixed this one potentially major issue that we're going to have to talk about. Let me explain. So I have a question. Are you an avid PC enthusiast stuck with that ugly ass Windows watermark ruining your gaming and streaming experience? Well, I have great news for you. WhoKeys is a software licensing website dedicated to getting you affordable keys. And the best part is you can get rid of that watermark in a matter of minutes. All you need to do is head down to the video description, click the sponsor link and enjoy an additional 25% off using my coupon code TL20. With PayPal checkout and quick key delivery, all you need to do is hit the Windows key, type activate and paste your key right here to become fully active. Activated. It really is that simple and that cheap. So head down to the video description if that sounds right for you. And thank you Hookies for sponsoring this video. The Phantom has everything you would expect from AMD's greatest. A flagship graphics core, PCI Express Gen 4 connectivity, the latest display outs, and of course, a massive 24 gigabytes of memory with enhanced ray tracing this generation. And that's about the limit of how this card is similar to AMD's reference design. And in many ways, that's a good thing because ASRock have done a really interesting job of revamping this version in some truly useful ways that I think most people will prefer. So ultimately, how is the Phantom different and is it different enough in a meaningful way? Well, let's compare the physical before we see which one performs better, starting with the unboxing. Neither of these cards come with anything in terms of accessories. And even though there's a support bar on the Phantom to stop sagging, the card is seriously heavy. And I found there's a three millimeter drop at the end of the PCB, which doesn't sound like much, but if you're really particular, this will be noticeable. So a basic GPU support bracket would have been a nice touch. But this is a byproduct of one of the biggest benefits of the Phantom. With a total volume 65% larger than the reference design and bigger fans, the combination of the two should help keep those thermals in check, which we will test in a bit. But I cannot go any further without talking about the design of the cards. AMD's reference version looks fantastic. I think they've done a great job this generation. I love the matte black and the minor red accents dotted and slotted over the card. And for those of you that were wondering, you can change the color of the LED through AMD's RGB tool. But the Phantom's vented and brushed accents with two zone lighting that illuminates behind the acrylic is a really nice touch and should look great either vertically or horizontally mounted. My only concern here is dust sticking to the back of the acrylic. The lighting seems to pick it up quite well and it may be difficult to clean. But speaking of RGB, this can be quite a polarizing topic. Some people may basically require it in their builds, whereas others just couldn't care less. And Azeroth seems to have tried to satisfy both groups of people with a couple cool features. If you don't want lighting, toggle this switch and you'll never be dazzled again. But if you want more lighting, you can connect any standard 3-pin 5050 device or addressable RGB strip so that the card itself can control those devices' effects through the Polychrome software. But two important things to highlight here, and the second one you really need to pay attention to. Number one, be careful with the connector. It has the stability of a drunk camel. But the potential severe issue of number two, for the love of all things holy, do not go plugging your motherboard's RGB header or an RGB controller into this port. At best, bye bye lighting. At worst, bye bye GPU and potentially motherboard. And this is my biggest complaint. That really should be in the quick start guide but neither this nor the box even mentions the feature, let alone how it operates or the effects of not using it correctly. 
and to the average consumer, it's not unrealistic to assume that it could be an input to control the lighting another way. So I really hope they put a warning sticker next to the port and update the documentation. Because the RGB output feature itself is really cool, and I would love to see more cards with this. Like, imagine a collection of RGB backplates that slot directly into this header. That would be absolutely awesome, and they should definitely make those as a first-party accessory. A simple and easy way to customize your GPU that could potentially even replace a backplate instead of sitting on top of it, like other custom ones. Maybe even turn red as the card gets hot or draws more power. Speaking of, both cards use the standard 8-pin PCIe power cable, but the Phantom uses three of them instead of two, which could suggest a higher power limit and more overclocking headroom, but we can't say if that's an aesthetic implementation or a functional upgrade until we test that in a bit. So let's see if that's the case, or if this card is more show than go. So because there are plenty of benchmarks and reviews comparing the reference XTX to RTX 4000 and the XT, in fact, these are our numbers for the current generation over about 100 games, most of you are well aware how the 7900 XTX compares to other graphics card models. So what I think will be more useful is to see how much better or worse the Phantom is compared to the reference design, which will allow us to dive a bit deeper into thermals and overclocking, for which we're going to need a test suite and a killer system. Let me show you. I'll have the full parts list below, but the most important components are the Ryzen 9 7950X, 32GB of DDR5 Fury Beast, and the ASRock X670 Extreme Tai Chi Carrera, which, if I didn't know any better, would say that it's specifically designed for me, with that marble aesthetic. Nice touch. All of our results will be using 1440p high settings on the new Vivence monitor from Galax, and let's see how these two cards perform at stock before we see which one overclocks better. Starting out with synthetics, the Phantom gains 1000 points over the reference, which is about 4% higher, but thermals is where things start to get a bit more interesting. Although the Phantom kept its core consistently 2 degrees lower, the memory on the other hand was 2 degrees higher, and the GPU hotspot 8 degrees higher, compared to the reference design. Still well within the thermal limit, but suggests that the reference design may have better overall contact with the core, while the Phantom has a better cooler. And we will have to see if that trend continues in our gameplay comparison. For which we're going to start with Shadow of the Tomb Raider. The reason that I wanted to test this is because it's an NVIDIA partnered title, and it's useful to see how AMD's new architecture scales in this scenario, which is pretty poorly, actually. As we saw in our synthetics, the Phantom is cooler on the core and higher for the hotspot, but the clocks and the frame rate is where things start to fall apart in this title. The Phantom saw less than a 1% gain, even though the clocks are about 10% higher compared to the reference card, and suggests that we're running into an optimization issue, either from the card itself or from the game engine, which is why it's important to test an NVIDIA title like this. So how does this change if we include an AMD title like Assassin's Creed Valhalla? We will come back to temperature in our roundup, as this is following the same trend that we've been seeing before, but we get a more significant increase to our average frames per second, about 5% more for the Phantom, and our 1% lows are also looking pretty good for this title. Title. Unlike Hogwarts Legacy, those 1% lows are extremely rough for both cards, but the averages are pretty good for such a demanding game running native, with no FSR or upscaling, like everything else that we've tested. We do it this way to remove software features that could cause performance variances, as especially comparing two of the same model, we are most interested in raw power, but Hogwarts shows very little difference between the Phantom and the reference card in this title. And here's a breakdown averaging everything. At stock, in the games that we tested, the Phantom performs about 3% faster compared to the reference card keeping its core a bit cooler but hotter for everything else. However, there's two things that need explaining here before we look into overclocking. The Phantom was able to draw about 50 watts more power compared to the reference card, up to 328 watts in our synthetic test. And even though the fan RPM was about 4.5% higher on the Phantom, these fans are also able to spin faster than the reference model. And both cards were typically running at about 50% fan speed. This is how they compare at those speeds. But what if we push these cards even harder and work on an overclock? Maybe that additional 8 pin on the Phantom can widen the gap even further, as long as it can keep those hotspot temperatures in check. Well, I tested a few different ways to see which gives us the best result. AMD's overclocking tool has three built-in overclocking presets, and GPU overclocking gave us the best result. However, a quick manual overclock did beat that, 
I was going to leave the fans to just set their own speed, but the Phantom started getting above 100 degrees on the hotspot. Still very much below the 110 degree junction temperature, which is when the card will start pulling back on clocks, so nothing to be overly concerned about. But that's over 10 degrees hotter while the fans barely increased at all. So I did set them both to 85%, which sounds like this. Other than the hotspot, this called the overclock cards better than stock and in most cases produced a healthy bump to our frame rate. Let me show you. The reference was 3% faster overclocked, but the Phantom beat that by 4%, pushing its front end clock to an average of nearly 3,150 in Tomb Raider, with shaders averaging over 2,800, and able to pull over 375 watts in synthetics, with the reference coming in 40 watts less than the Phantom, with lower clocks. But the other way to look at this is if you are concerned about efficiency, the reference is the better option. Over 10% less power draw for only a few percent performance difference compared to the Phantom. The trade-off, however, was mainly in the hotspot, about 20% higher on the Phantom. And even though that does sound pretty bad, this is still 21 degrees lower than the limit and still well within spec. Which brings us back to the original point. The Phantom does outperform the reference card and it's currently the same price or cheaper. But is there a reason why I spent 5% more on a worse performing card? Well, yes. I was going to follow up this video with my experience of swapping over to AMD because even though my editing system has to remain Nvidia, I really wanted to build my gaming system back up on an all AMD platform and share my experience of swapping over. And this is where there's two reasons to go for the AMD reference model over the Phantom. And unfortunately, at least one of them applies to me for now. First and foremost, custom cooling. Because the Phantom has a custom PCB, you're going to have a harder time finding a water block for this model and will likely cost you more, destroying the savings you got from going with the Phantom. And secondly, like almost every card this generation, the Phantom is big, too big for my gaming system. So I may be using my own money and picking the reference card over the Phantom. But if you just want a card to drop into your system that's going to give you the best performance at this price range and is wrapped up in a pretty package with some nice but cautionary RGB extras, be wary of the drunk camel, it seems pretty silly for most people to choose the more expensive, worst performing card, making the Phantom the one that I would recommend for most people. But if you're interested in picking up either one, links to both will be in the description and the comments. However, GPU prices fluctuate, and with sub $700 RX 6950 XTs, the 7900 XTX has a lot of competition. So how do you know that you're getting the best value GPU for your money? Well, check out the GPU value playlist. One of the most popular videos is the best GPU to buy right now, where we update you on the cheapest models and compare their performance to get you the best value option for your budget. You can check that out by clicking here. Otherwise guys, share, like, subscribe, they are always appreciated and I hope you have an amazing day.